Greetings. Um, today I'm going to talk about a film that is uh, 55 years old. Um, it's one that is very important uh, for just film in general. Um, and I'll talk about that as I go along. Um, this film is a uh, Easy Writer. This is the from the Criterion Collection. Um, there was a BB. Uh, S uh, collection that had this film but there's like a couple movies that I had actually seen at that point when I first saw this because this came out in 2016 on its own and I think uh, a year or so prior um, this film uh was with that collection I could have that wrong but I just remember first seeing it there and while that looked cool the price because this was I got this was what I saw that set was at uh, Barnes and Noble and Barnes and Noble can you know be fairly expensive and you know because it was multiple movies you know it was over 100 bucks which does make sense, but even then, it's like, you know, for 50% off, it's like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get that. Um, just because the price, sometimes Barnes and Nobles, Noble can sometimes jack the price up a bit more. That way, not only will Criterion get a good chunk of the money, but so will they. Um, I guess that's neither here nor there, but basically, I got this on its own. Uh, but if you have never seen this film in short, um, Wyatt and uh, Billy, uh, played by Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper, both of whom wrote this film with te uh, with Terry Southern. Terry Southern co-wrote Dr. Strangelove, in case that name sounds familiar to anybody, and who has also seen that film. He co-wrote that film with Stanley Kubrick. And this film was produced by Peter Fonda and directed by Dennis Hopper. Um, uh, the film opens with uh, the two of them, uh, Wyatt played by Fonda and Billy by Hopper. They come, with a, come from Mexico to L.A. to... Uh, they've smuggled cocaine and they're selling it. They have a, get a bunch of money, and uh, obviously because you know it's good and this drug deal went right, all right. And uh, they're also near an airport too, <laughs> where this is happening. Which I I just remember the first time. I, that's an interesting place to do some sort of drug deal. That's near an airport because the planes are. Like landing and everything, so I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, I guess people wouldn't necessarily suspect <laughs> that's where you know a, a drug deal would happen, and of course, there's also other things, but they also get the, like motorcycles and they travel, uh, they're going to Mardi Gras, and so that's part of what the money is for, uh, you know, they're able to. And they're going to state to state to, you know, New Orleans where, you know, Mardi Gras happens. Um, and they meet some people. Um, they pick up a hitchhiker who's going to a commune. They stay there for a bit to eat and uh, uh, you know, they uh, just have a they have a good time, but also, you know, Billy, he's kind of like, yeah, well, I'm kind of, he's not totally feeling the commune, like, you know, I, he doesn't f feel like he's completely welcome, so he's like, I don't know, I should probably, like, we should probably get out of here, and, uh, they spend some time with some, uh, again, like some ladies, and, uh, there, and, and then, uh, and then they take off, and as they're going, they uh, get to 
you know, uh, New Mexico, and they need uh, George Harrison, uh, who's played by Jack Nicholson, um, who's a lawyer. They're in they're in jail because well, they were going through a parade, basically in uh, New Mexico, uh, but they were uh, arrested for parading without a permit, and so they're jailed, and then. Uh, George is there because he's it was drunk and yeah, he, he was able to sober up and then he's able to get himself out as well as Wyatt and Billy. And you know they're talking you're like oh, oh Mardi Gras I'll try to go you know, I try to get there a time or two and you know just never did and you know you have a helmet <laughs> says Wyatt. Well, I got a helmet. <laughs> I've got a beauty, <laughs> a beauty or whatever. And the, he has a a football helmet that he's wearing if, uh, instead of a motorcycle helmet. But you know he does have a helmet at least. So and they're on their way. And uh, he also mentions a a, a brothel and. Uh, there, where, where Mardi Gras, is, you know, in New Orleans, where Mardi Gras is going to happen. Uh, and, um, yeah, it, I don't want to say more because for anybody who has not seen this film, and I know sometimes people who watch my stuff, they don't always, um, have, they haven't always seen this film, and that's fine. Or films like this, you know be it like classic movies or even some new movies, you know, because, you know, life happens and sometimes you can only see so many movies at a time. Um, but this is a very good film. Um, this was very inspirational, as I mentioned, because, you know, this wasn't a very expensive film to make. And um, in a way, it was a kind of a big, it was a big gamble for, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda, and considering Peter Fonda produces, I got kind of really, you know, putting a lot in here. And his father Henry saw the film, or or at least they were he and his son were talking. He's like, I don't know, Peter. You know, this might uh, might not turn out too well. And uh, Jane uh, Fonda, you know, Peter's sister saw a cut of it uh i made a rough cut but saw a version of it and it's like yeah i don't know if this is gonna do anything peter but so this went out in the end of the in multiple film festivals particularly uh the Cannes film festival and i know special features here there's a well there's two commentaries one with Peter, uh, or Dennis Hopper by himself, as well as with Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, and production manager Paul Lewis. I have not listened to the commentaries. Um, I've never listened to the commentaries of this film before, so I don't know if it's any good, if they're any good or not, but it'd be interesting to listen to them. There's some documentaries like uh, Born to be Wild and He's a Writer, Shaking the Cage, it's basically about the, you know, making of the films as well as the kind of like the impact it had culturally. Um, television excerpts showing Hopper and Fonda at the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. New video of the BBS co-founder, Steve uh, Blunner. Uh, BBS, yeah. Uh, uh, well, at least I pronounced it right now. I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I... Uh, just talk, and um, I believe I pronounce something correctly, then I just don't. But but anyway, because of how successful this film turned out to be, you know, critically and commercially, again, it wasn't a very expensive film, but also, it just didn't also, this seemed to be like the kind of movie that at the end of the day, it would be a big, 
major success that would connect. Uh, I've read like they thought at most perhaps I might get into a few into a few theaters, but then it would probably be, you know if it would make any kind of money back uh, for the budget and make any kind of profit, it would probably probably be for uh, you know the drive-ins. Uh, but you know this film was a huge hit, and because of that, people filmmakers of the seventies like uh, George Lucas. Steven Spielberg, uh, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, John Milius, uh, so many, they were able to, you know, Brian De Palma, they were able to be, uh, get their own films off the ground because of this. Because it's like, well, you know, young people are making films like this. That was a success. So let's actually go to look at film schools. And uh, that's how people were able to get their own uh, foot in the door, able to get their own stuff off the ground and made. Um, of course, Francis Ford Coppola was making stuff in the 60s also. He graduated from film school, but still, you know, the, the uh, this film really helped people embrace uh, within the industry to look at people who can make movies not super expensive, and if, in a way, they're kind of left alone to their own devices, they're able to make uh, something that'd be uh, quite profitable, as well as just generally good. This film is uh, really good on its own, honestly. Um, on its own. It's just good in general. You know, it's not just good because of, you know, the cultural significance. Um um, you know, the, the music in this film is really good. Um, of course, the Steppenwolf song, Born to be Wild, uh, that they've played at the beginning, like during the opening credits, that has become essentially a staple for uh, films where there's like people riding motorcycles. It's like, oh, you got to have that song <laughs> in there with... Uh, uh, with that scene. Um, so that's one thing. Um, this film um, helped make Jack Nicholson a big star. He earned his first Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Fonda, Hopper, and Southern were all nominated for Best Original Screenplay for this film. Um, Yeah, I know that they uh, are also, like, when they're going through the film, or making this film, like, uh, trying to find the American dream. <laughs> What's up? Some stuff like people are saying behind the scenes, and here's something at the commune. There you go. And the uh, other cast, uh, Phil Spector plays the guy who, uh, you know, is the guy who uh, buys the drugs. And he's uh, somebody, I mean, he, he's a famous record producer, music and everything. But uh, yeah, if you don't know um, much about Phil Spector and some stuff, uh, about his later life. Um, might be interesting to just uh, look that up if you haven't heard, but yeah, Phil Spector, he's quite a guy. Uh, or was, he's deceased now, but he, uh, yeah, he, I mean, he produced a lot of excellent songs and albums, so I mean, I'll, on that hand, you know, he knew what he was doing, career-wise, but also, yeah, some, he's something, uh, uh, 
stranger on the highway. Guy that they pick up to pick to the commune, Lucas Skew. Escu, yeah, Escu, uh, uh, of course, George Henson's Jack Nicholson, uh, Tony Basil and Karen Black are in this film. Yeah, and, uh, Of course, there's also drugs in this film. Um, should be obvious, I think, to some extent, but with the kind of film. But you know, there's you know, you know marijuana joints being smoked. There's LSD and uh, some cocaine, obviously, from the beginning. And according to Dennis Hopper, real drugs were used during the making of the film. So, yeah, that's a. Uh, that's quite something. Um, obviously, the result, you know, it came to a very good film. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is just a an essay about the film. Film was lauded at the 1969 Cannes Film Festival. It was one of the most profitable films ever made. It launched Fonda and Nicholson towards Stoneham and enshrined Hopper as a hero to wannabe indie directors everywhere. It turned the contemporary jukebox soundtrack into a filmmaking cliche. And Kovacs, one of the one of Hollywood's most sought after cinematographers. Yeah. The the it's interesting how for the cameras what they got what they did was they got a whole bunch of their friends together and go throughout the whole from California to New Orleans and all that to, and they got them to like hold the cameras and uh, other random people on the where at the, at the locations they were shooting the film at <laughs> they were able to get them to uh, be essentially cameramen or camera women you know um it's it's an interesting way that they made the film and uh you know it's very documentary like honestly uh, especially in various scenes throughout the film and uh yeah very good film uh <clears throat> re-watching it i can definitely see <clears throat> How this was very inspirational to a lot of people, like young filmmakers, and it's just a very well made film, well acted, and um, definitely a film that uh, deserves the praise it has received. Um, yeah. I hope. Uh, this video is uh, quite interesting, and I know I wore a different hat, Paps Blue Ribbon, which I wore when I talked about uh, uh, Blue Velvet, which also stars uh, Dennis Hopper, but also, you know, the whole red, white, and blue, and also, I have yet to receive a haircut. Cause it's still pretty cool out. Uh, it's supposed to get warmer. Uh, uh, like I said, the time of recording, it's still March, but you'll probably see that it's in April. So, but yeah, it should probably get uh, uh, warmer soon. So I'll probably get haircut and then some time I'll probably shave but yeah, uh, yeah I doubt I look like Dennis Hopper in any way in this film but because you know he just had a mustache and <laughs> his hair was a bit longer than mine I believe so yeah um, and it's interesting how uh, over the years he had 
fairly short hair for the rest of his life and career. You know, uh, and Peter Fonda had fairly reasonable normal length hair. Of course, in the film, you know, those characters look very out there. Um, but, you know, uh, it's just uh, one of those things where this film really uh, showed how, you know, different, <laughs> how uh, a, dir a different light about um, of America <laughs> You know, at that point in time, with the whole, like, uh, drugs and, you know, hippie kind of lifestyle and looks and everything, you know. Um, and that also was fairly inspirational uh, for various uh, films to come in the 70s. But, uh, yeah, I... Uh, that's really all I have to say about this film. I mean, I could keep going on and on, just as I could for, for a lot of these movies, honestly. But this is a very good film. If you haven't seen it, I think it'd be worth watching at least once to see what you think. Um, perhaps the whole, huh, you know, content of the film might not be too appealing to some with the whole drugs and the old Mardi Gras, and obviously there's like sex and stuff here or there, though. Nothing explicit, but, you know. It's just a very good film. Uh, it's 95 minutes long, so not a terribly long film. So if you end up not enjoying this, well, at least you didn't waste like two, two and a half hours. Um, and yeah. That's really all I have to say. Hope you're all having a great day. Hope you all have a, will have a great weekend and a great week. And I shall see you all next time. Take care.